Great. Yeah. Okay, so I'll get started. Uh, my name's Guy James. Um, I'm English, but I live in Spain. Um, and I've, I've done this presentation a few times before, but always in Spanish. So this is the first time I've done it in English. So uh, it'll be interesting because I'll, I'll maybe thinking in Spanish and then have to translate it into English, which is a bit a bit strange when it's your native language. But um, I've been involved with some um, uh, community currency projects before and crypto projects. So basically in, in 2007, 2008, when the financial crisis happened, um, I, I really started to uh, start to think, what is money and why why is it affected everybody so much? What why when the economy crashes, why does it destroy people's lives? What, you know, what really is money? And I think a lot of people in that moment started to to focus on that. Um, and so it's it's a bit like when you when you start meditating, you kind of go into like, who am I? And then you realize you're not you're not what you thought you were that the things that seem solid kind of disappear and i had the same experience with money like the more i looked at it the more it kind of disappeared and eventually you get down to like what is value um so the title of this of this presentation is um mutual credit or how to avoid another economic crisis so that was because of the my initial sort of inquiries into money and economics came with uh, with the initial, well, the most recent really big economic crisis. I think we're going to get another, or we're in another one with COVID as well. I mean, they've printed a load of money to try and put it off as much as possible, but it's it's in the in the post, let's say, another really big one. Um, so what, why, why is that happening? Um, basically, it's because capitalism lives on crises. So just got another person, I'll just let them in. So basically, capitalism has to keep growing. So it's like a, a shark has to keep swimming. And if it stops swimming, it, it will start to die, basically. And capitalism has to keep growing. If it, if it stops growing, then it immediately starts to die. It immediately becomes decadent and fragile and starts to collapse. Um, and of course, as we're reaching the limits to growth on this planet, we're seeing more and more that that is the case, that um, it can't grow anymore because it's reached the limits to growth, which they warned of in the early 70s. And we're, we're there now, basically. And in, in many cases, we're, we're well beyond that. So capitalism is optimized for efficiency, not, not resilience. So, so this, is, this is obvious, like it, it has to keep growing. There's, the basic reason is there's more debt than money. So money is created as debt, mostly by private banks and with interest on top. So there's always more money that needs to be paid back than money that actually exists, which means we have to convert nature and relationships and things that were previously free into money, into numbers on a screen, which eventually end up in tax havens, in the Cayman Islands, in Andorra, in these, in these places where the rich people are siphoning, the, the, I mean, the super rich, I'm not talking about millionaires like billionaires, they're siphoning off the, the money in, into tax havens so basically it starts off as a tree or a forest or an ocean and it gets turned into money in a tax haven. So it's not a resilient system because it has to keep growing. It's a fragile system. So how do we create resilience? So to, to, to look at how we create resilience, we need to go into where does money come from? So fiat money people refer to fiat money which means government money in general fiat means spoken into existence so it's it's literally created out of nothing you work your entire life to pay back a loan which the bank created in five seconds because the bank, banks are allowed to create money 
So when you go and ask for a mortgage on your house or another kind of loan, that money didn't exist before. People generally think that that money existed. And apologies if, I, if I'm just saying something you, you already know, but um, maybe some of the other people who watch the recording won't, have, uh, won't understand this. Um, the money didn't previously exist. When, when the bank created the loan, they created the money. And when they're given a banking charter, they're given the power to actually create money. They're not lending you money that they already had. Because of fractional reserve banking, a bank is allowed to create a lot more money than it actually owns in savings. So because there's always more debt than money, the system has to keep expanding. And in order to do that, we've created this thing called consumerism, which means for all this money that's being created, and, and for example, in a COVID like in a crisis like COVID, they're kind of trying to kick the can down the road and delay the crisis by printing a hell of a lot of money. So recently, I saw a seeds presentation, and they said that 20% um, of all US dollars ever created were created last year in 2020. And they probably created a similar amount already in 2021. So that so it's just like an exponential growth of the amount of fiat money that's being created, and that has to go somewhere. So they're trying to create a kind of false demand to get people to buy stuff, to so that there's some use for this money. Otherwise, it just goes into asset bubbles and see how expensive housing is becoming, and food is becoming, it's, and and the the crypto bubble as well. That money's got to go somewhere. So speaking about crypto, the solution is Bitcoin, right? Well, Bitcoin is also a fiat currency because it's created out of nothing. It was when Satoshi Nakamoto created the code for Bitcoin, there was going to be, I think it's 21 million Bitcoin and that can't be changed. So that's like a, a hard limit. Um, and that was that was created from as fiat, as I say that this money exists, now it exists. Um, and as because there's a hard limit, Bitcoin is based on artificial scarcity. It's not based on the demand of human beings for products and services. It's created as I'm going to create a load of money. I mean, I, th I think Bitcoin's a brilliant, um, a brilliant invention. It's, it's an amazing technology and it solved the problem. Um, which had been the, maybe centuries of people trying to think about that problem, how, how it could never be solved. Finally, I mean, basically how to have secure money without a bank, how to have decentralized secure money, and it solved that problem. So that's brilliant. But Satoshi Nakamoto was a programmer, and I don't think he or she was an economist. So, or they, let's say, was an economist. Um, so it, it was created as artificial scarcity and of course as we all know it has this enormous energy footprint um, larger than the energy use of some entire country so is there another option what is mutual credit could mutual credit be another option so so what i really want people to take away from this presentation is we don't need banks to create money. We can just create money between me and you or our community. We can do it peer to peer. So when, when we need something doing, we can just create the money. And, that, and that's what mutual credit is basically. It's a way of just creating money. So in fact, we're not even creating money. It's just accounting, which is why, um, when you interact with the government about your transaction in mutual credit, in many, in many countries, it's not counted as money. It's counted simply as accounting. So you're, you don't have to pay tax on it because you're, it's a accounting of favors. So like you did me a favor, now I owe you a favor. That's basically it, except it's denominated in money. So you did me, a, in general, it doesn't have to be denominated in money, but that's the easiest way. For example, I'm in a mutual credit network and everything's denominated in euros. 
So if you bring your potatoes to the mutual credit market, um, the potatoes cost two euros a kilo, but it's, we call it trucks. So it's two trucks a kilo, but one truck is one euro. So it's, it's denominated in money, but no actual money changes hands. It's just like a database of who has bought what, and you kind of owe it to the community instead of necessarily to an, to an individual. It's like a, a ledger of the different favors that people have done for each other or done for the community. So what are the advantages to mutual credit? Um, there's no interest. So when mutual credit is created, um, I, I imagine it probably would be possible to do it with interest, but there's no real reason to do so because you can, everybody can create money. You don't have to reward like a capitalist, somebody who's, who's bringing capital because you just create the money between the, between the two parties in the transaction. So there's, there's no interest on mutual credit. So it hasn't got the problem that it has to continually grow like the default economy. The balance of all total transactions is always equal to zero. So if I have plus 10 mutual credit tokens, somebody else must have, or some other people must have a total of minus 10. So it always balances to zero, which to me seems like a, a very elegant solution. And as Buckminster Fuller said, if, if I create a solution and it's not beautiful, then I know it must be wrong. Um, and I think mutual credit is a very elegant and beautiful solution where all of the money in the system equals absolutely zero, which in a way is more, it's, it's a more honest way of doing money because money is really only worth what we say it's worth. And ultimately you can argue that it, it's worth nothing. It's worth everything. It's worth everything of, of how we transact with each other is useful, but the ultimate value is zero in total. And this is, this is how mutual credit works. So it's based on demand, not supply. So there's not like an enormous, um, enormous amount of mutual credit tokens that we have to use like with Bitcoin or like with fiat money, like with government money, where it's just, they're just constantly creating more money. Um, and it's not related to what we actually want to use it for. Mutual credit is I need something doing, I will pay someone to do that thing. And then I pay them with mutual credit. So it's, it's, it's inherently the other way around. It's, it's based on the demand of real people. I need to eat something, therefore I will buy some onions. And that that money is created when I buy the onions. So by, by me and the other person with the onions, um, I, would, I would pay, let's say, a euro for a kilo or a euro's worth of mutual credit money for a kilo of onions, the other per I get minus one and the other person gets plus one. So it's, it's quite a simple system. And a lot of mutual credit systems, you could run it on a blockchain, but they don't need a blockchain. The system we use is just a database, like an old uh, Drupal system that's more than 10 years old. And it's just like a simple database for the accounting of these favors that we are doing for each other. So it has a stable value. Um, the value is denominated in money and it's just what we say it is. So uh, in, in the network I'm in, we say it's worth one euro, one, one mutual credit token. It's non-speculative because th there isn't a fixed amount. So what makes Bitcoin speculative is the fact that there's a, there's a fixed amount. So a, something that's scarce, you can, you can buy it and hoard it and bet on it and the value will go up. Whereas with mutual credit, there's no fixed amount. It's, the money is just created as we need it. So you can't get a load of mutual credit tokens and sit on them and then the value goes up relative to other things. It, it just, because somebody else could just create more when they need it, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, have that speculative element. So in a way, it's a lot more, it's a lot more of a healthy way of doing transactions in my opinion and it helps to create a, a circular economy because people are incentivized to, to go to merchants and people who provide services and say would you like to, to um, 
would you like to accept this mutual credit token? And, and the community creates a kind of circular economy around everybody who's, who's using the, the mutual credit. For example, I can buy bread in a bread shop and that bread shop ends up with a lot of tokens, but they needed uh, the outside of the shop painted. So they asked a, a, um, a guy who does painting if, uh, if he would accept mutual credit. And he said, yes. So, that, so for all these loaves of bread they sold, they paid the guy to paint the front of their house. Now he's got a load of um, token and he will spend those, probably a part of those, some restaurants accept them as well, but he'll probably spend a lot of that on bread in the next year or two. And so it's like a circular economy. So it's just keeping track of favors that we've done for each other, basically. So to get into the, the details of um, mutual credit, um, you can go into, into debt with mutual credit. So as I said, like if somebody has uh, plus 10, I'm gonna speed up a little bit now because I think we're running out of time. Um, if somebody has plus 10, somebody else has to have minus 10. So everybody can go into debt up to a certain limit. So that limit can be fixed. So you can say, for example, you can have up to minus 100, 100 credits, um, or it can be a dy dynamic limit. So that you start off with, a, with zero credit limit. You have to actually put some value into the system. So for example, if you get a, a positive balance of plus 50, then you're allowed to suddenly uh, go into debt of minus 50. So that gives you 100 credits to play with. Um, there, there's a, a large network in Sardinia called uh, Sard, Sardex. Um, they, they have dynamic limits. So you have to, to put a, a certain amount of value into the network, and then you, you get rewarded with being able to go more into debt. Um, they also take a 1% cut from, the, from each of their members to keep the whole system running and to maintain the, the database and the administration. Um, I won't go into the uh, what mutual credit can be backed by. You, it can be backed by money or by services or by could be backed by solar power or it could just be backed by nothing. Uh, as long as there's trust in the community, it doesn't necessarily need to be backed by anything, but I won't go too deeply into that. Um, the limitations of mutual credit, you can't pay taxes with it at the moment, I don't think anywhere. Governments generally don't accept uh, these kind of accounting favours. Uh, because they want you to use their fiat money. Um, that there are large circular economies, but many products aren't available in mutual credit. You probably won't be able to buy an air ticket or a, a petrol or these kind of things anytime soon, or guns or <laughs> this kind of thing <laughs> with mutual credit. Um, so it's good for things like food and getting people to paint your house and massages and Reiki and this kind of thing, generally stuff, stuff that people use in a community. Um, of course, if, if the default economy really crashes, then you'll find a hell of a lot more things being used uh, available in mutual credit. Uh, one, one problem that I touched on with the, the bread shop that was re receiving a lot of credits, um, some people end up with an enormous surplus in, of their positive balance and they can't get rid of it. So they've had all the massages and guitar lessons and bought all the bread they need and they've still got an enormous amount of positive credit um, when somebody really needs their products but they don't need anything from the network in return or they, they don't need as much in the network in return. Then it can create a kind of bottleneck of some people having too many tokens. Um, trust is very important. So everybody gets um, a negative limit at some point, otherwise the system wouldn't work. But of course, then, then you're open to people creating a, an account, going into the, the limit of their negative and then just leaving. So it ends up with a lot of people in, in a negative account, almost the opposite problem from somebody having too many credits. P people engaging with the network up to the negative limit and then leaving. So trust is very important. People in a, in a mutual credit, um, system everybody really needs to know each other or know someone that knows somebody else in order for it to work if, if there's no trust then you will inevitably get this kind of 
bad actors who come in and use up their negative limit and then go away or um, make one account, use up the negative limit and then make another account. The larger the network is, the harder that is to police, let's say. So you have to be careful with that. It, for this reason, because you need trust, it needs to be like under the Dunbar number really of 150, 200 people. Um, it doesn't scale well to have a mutual credit of a million a mutual credit network of a million people wouldn't work because you can't know a million people so it's how to scale that trust there's there's various solutions to that the, the way we're doing it in our region is our our network's about 300 people maybe 200 active users um so it's working it's working well and it's also joined to other networks of about the same size so, so we can, we've got like trust in our network and then we can go to Barcelona, for example, and, and our money, let's say, is compatible with their money. So we can spend it there and they, they can come to us and if they're visiting our region, they, they can spend it with us. So in that way, you end up with um, networks which are kind of tightly um, compressed in terms of people trusting each other. But... Um, they can also go into other regions and and spend their tokens or credits with with other with other people so so then you end up with a, a large amount of people using mutual credit that they're not in the same network but they're in networks using a compatible system um, a, a nicer way of doing it is actually to nest the networks and have it like a fractal but that's that's going that's going beyond the scope of this talk really but that 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 is probably going to be the best way to do it in the future. So examples of mutual credit um, networks, um, a lot of B two B business to business networks um, exist, and people who are often supplying each other um, end up just saying, "Well, you supply me this, or you supply me this every month, and you need this from me, so we don't need to use money. We'll we'll do it like a." almost like a swap but we'll keep count of it um and they use mutual credit to do that in a in a business to business network um i mentioned sardex that's that's a that's a very large one in sardinia i believe most businesses in sardinia are in that network um the open credit network that that's a um a large um worldwide uh coordination network of mutual credit um, creditcommons.net this is um, Matthew Slater and Dill Green's project they're working on uh, doing this nested mutual credit solution and I recommend checking out their website um, creditcommons.net and their, their YouTube channel where they explain how it works uh, because they're, they're really trying to take it to the next level and allow mutual credit to scale in a much more um, much larger but more, more organic way So the, the next steps, mutual credit, well, that um, credit commons is a, is a nice solution. Um, Holochain is also a very uh, beautiful solution, um, which is uh, a way of creating, let's say a grammar for creating basically currencies um, and currencies, many of which would be based on mutual credit. So they're starting with um, a mutual credit currency called Holofuel. Um, at the moment, it's represented by a crypto token, but they're going to uh, swap the token for mutual credit tokens. Um, that's that's a really nice one to look into. The Ecoshasha, which is uh, the Eco Network, um, would be translated as, uh, is the network that I'm in, which is in uh, Catalonia, and that's a very active network. A lot of people in our in our region are um, are using that. It's a kind of prosumer network. So a lot of people, for example, have chickens and they sell eggs or they grow uh, vegetables and they sell them in the network or they, they do different services for people. Um, I believe there's a nice one in, in the Canary Islands called Demos, which a lot of people there use. And they have like uh, markets where you, can, where you can use this Demos money uh, instead of euros. Um, so. I, th I think in in general in countries or regions where the default economy is still working 
Um, and I, I stress still because I don't think it's a sustainable system at all and it won't work indefinitely. But in, in places like, let's say, Norway or Switzerland, the default economy is working very well. And it's just people just aren't going to be interested in mutual credit. Whereas places like here in Spain or maybe South Africa, Argentina, where they've had like endless um, currency problems, mutual credit is a, is a very interesting solution. And because you don't need permission, you just you just set it up and you can create the money between two people doing a transaction. Um, it can really be useful in, in times of economic crisis. So we can, we can create new currencies and change the world and we don't need banks. That's, that's the basic takeaway from this session. So um, if anyone's got any questions, um, I'll be happy to give it a go. Thank you so much for for your um, presentation. I'm gonna. I have uh, so many questions, and I'd love to connect with you directly by email. But right now, I'd love to know how do you legally create mutual credit as an organization? Let's say a company wants to believe in that system. How do you even start? Um, well, I think if if possible, um, one would uh, create the um, one one would join an organization already using mutual credit. So for example, in Britain, um, that would be probably Credit Commons um, or the Open Credit Network. I think the Open Credit Network's in the USA as well. Um, but basically one would look for um, either a B2B uh, business to business network in, in the region where you are or a, an organization like the Echo Shasha, the eco network where, where, where I am, and just ask them. Most of these organizations are, are very happy to help people come on board and start using the, um, their, their mutual credit systems. If not, then you can contact um, an organization like um, CES, which is Community Exchange Systems, which is in South Africa. That was created by a guy called Tim Jenkins who's an incredibly interesting guy. Um, if you search for Tim Jenkin on YouTube, he's got some amazing stories of how he helped the anti-apartheid uh, fight in South Africa and all these things. Um, and he, he, he wrote a, a mutual credit software and created an organization called CES. And we actually in Spain use um, an open source version of that called Integral CES. Um, so I'm really, pleased to be some in some way connected with Tim Jenkins because uh, he's one of my heroes for sure. And then once you are part of one network, how do you ensure that the uh, mutual credit that you use are compatible with all the others throughout the world to not yeah, be that's... limited to just a very local type of business, especially if you're in the tech? How do you do that? Um, well, most mutual credit systems are not compatible with each other. So you, you are going to be limited to your local region at the moment. Um, when Holochain comes out and they make it much easier to create um, mutual credit currencies, and I, I would think there will be some kind of uh, merger between the idea of nested mutual credit currencies and um, Holochain is not a blockchain, but it's a distributed ledger. So between this distributed ledger technology and the nested mutual credit currencies to make a lot of um, currencies compatible with each other. Also Credit Commons is working on um, a kind of protocol. Credit Commons is basically a protocol for mutual credit networks and existing uh, mutual credit systems can be added to this protocol so that, so that they were not previously compatible. Most mutual credit systems were started by basically one person in a very small region with their babysitting circle or their farmer's market or their friends together. And they, they never really wanted it to scale. So they never made it compatible. But what, what we're going to get with Credit Commons, uh, it's just being rolled out now, is it will allow different mutual credit uh, currencies to be able to be compatible one with the other. So, so then that, that makes it very 
very exciting if, if you start getting something like Sardex or uh, the Echo Sharsha where, where we are, being able to be compatible with something in, in another country, and then other, other forms of exchange start becoming possible. As I said, I don't think you'll ever see petrol or air tickets available in mutual credit, but um, maybe things like technology, computers and smartphones and things, might, you might be able to, to buy those in, in mutual credit if, if these networks become connected and become very large. So at the moment, I can spend mutual credit um, in a network of a maybe, I don't know, 10,000 people, if you, if you add up all the networks using the compatible money. But if it was 10 million people, then, then that would be, that would be much more interesting. Thank you very much. I just hosted a Holochain workshop. I'm coming from a different angle, which is business marketing, uh, looking at technology as a, as a way to expand and scale this idea of trust that we can have uh, on a scale uh, model. And uh, okay, so maybe going into the Holochain um, community and trying to find out who's building mutual credit and how do you get on the, the wagon, on the train? Yeah, um, well, I can tell you actually, um, Guillaume Cordoba, who's actually from, from this general area in Catalonia, um, is, is building mutual credit on Holochain. He's done like a, a demo of it. So he, he's the guy to talk to, definitely. I have a question too. Uh, can, can be inflation in the mutual credit? Um, no, because um, because the money is created and destroyed um, as needed, basically. Mm -hmm. So, so if I, so it's not pegged on the dollar, for example. No, no, no. The, okay. um, in a way, I suppose inflation does affect it, though, because your your mutual credit is denominated in dollars or euros. And those are losing value over time. So, in in a way, um, let's say ten years ago, maybe six eggs cost one euro, and now it costs two euros or one fifty or whatever it is. And the mutual credit is denominated in in euros, so it is actually losing value, simply because it's denominated in the fiat currency, um, which is not necessary at all. You could just say, you know, one one mutual credit token, let's say, or credit is worth, you know, what, what a euro was worth when euros first started in 1992. But then, then you're starting to get, it becomes too complicated. What you, you really need people to be able to understand it very quickly because it's, it's already a kind of leap of imagination to be able to say, um, we're going to create this money between just you and me or just, just this community. Um, and if you start denominating it in, in other currencies or something, or in other ways, like saying um, one credit is worth one loaf of bread. So that's, that's another whole paradigm shift people need to kind of get their heads around. So I, th I, I would but generally, yeah, it's not ideal that it is denominated in a currency which is actually losing value and it is being affected, um, affected by inflation. But simply for simplicity's sake, uh, I think at the moment that's probably the best, the best um, solution we have. I would say because it's it's about onboarding people and making it easy for people. Thank you. Any other questions? We've only got two minutes left, so if not, I'll. Uh, I'll uh, stop. Thank you very much. That was very useful. I'm looking forward to uh, more interaction. Great. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Okay, I'll stop recording.